Welcome everyone to the Wombology Tournament here on this fine Saturday afternoon, morning, whatever time it is where you are watching this. I'm your host, Calum Leslie. I'm very pleased to be here, not least because for the next two days I get to work with one of my favorite analysts, Blizzard approved Hearthstone yeah. Championship Tour Caster. Yeah. Sotil, it is a it is honestly a privilege to be in your presence. Wow. Glowing, glowing phrase from, from Callum Leslie. The UK's answer to Frodan right here, Mr. <laughs> Callum Leslie. Um, yeah, it's, it's an honor to be back with you again, Callum. Obviously, we have worked together a ton in the past, but uh, you've taken a little, little back seat on the, on the casting front for the past few months. Oh, it's just, you know, I can't keep up right. with you guys. Right. Kill You're involved in a, in a very, very successful tournament at Insomnia True Silver Championship, though, but in a more behind the scenes role. So you haven't completely disappeared, just picked up some other priorities. But enough about us, Callum. Twitch yeah. chat don't care about us. Let's talk about no, what's they, going they on. They really today. don't, especially me. Um, like you, people like you, uh, we've discovered. People uh, on the internet, they're uh, subtle fans. Uh, uh, yeah, we're here for the Wombology tournament. It is a 16 player single elimination tournament over the next two days. And I have to say, this bracket is absolutely stacked. So we're going to talk about it in a little while, but holy crap, we've got some of the best players in the world for you. Of course, this tournament is being brought to you by Womble.gg, where you can play uh, money matches and games like Hearthstone and loads of other top esports games you can play against pros, you can play against your friends and play for money. I know a lot of Hearthstone pros have been doing that to maybe make their games a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Uh, Sixo, who we'll see later on, he's been uh, playing a lot of these matches, doing quite well, I understand. And of course, the tournament is also sponsored by Shoe, ScreenShoe.com, so you can check them out as well. All the information about the organizers and the sponsors, you can click on the banners in the, uh, in the Twitch description down below. And of course, these 16 players, they're playing for a share of $6,000. $6,000 is what they're playing for. Uh, first prize is $3,500. Second, second prize, $1,500 $500 for top four. So they have, to win, uh, they have to win two matches to get in the money. That's not too bad. And of course, if they're able to win, outlast everyone else in this stacked field, they will take home that $3,500. Uh, but let's get into talking about this player list. So our first match we're going to have coming up is Eloise versus Kranich, which is a super intriguing matchup. Let's circle back around to that in a second. Sure. But what are some of the players you would want to highlight for people in this bracket? <laughs> I mean, where do you start? You could pretty much highlight every player, but let's just let's just pick some out. We have 6-0, of course. Absolute killer in kind of 16-man invitationals. This kind of format absolutely smashes these things apart. Yeah, he, has it? he went on a, a tear in like October, November, where I think he won like three or four of these in a row. Right. He, I remember he, he tweeted and like posted the, the odds. If every game was 50-50 in Hearthstone, like the chances of him winning those tournaments in a row, and it was to like the eighth decimal place or something. It was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, we have 6-0. We have Dog, one of the highest ranked players in the world right now, if you go by GoTo Gamers. Um, huge success recently, picked up some huge performances in tournaments. We have Firebat, the previous world champion, recently displaced by Oskaka. We have Strife Crow, one of the old guard. Definitely considered probably one of, if not the best player in the world at one point, you know, in the early life of Hearthstone. Hasn't followed that up with too many huge tournament wins recently, but we know Strife Crow is an amazing player in his own right. Um, just going through again, we have we have Zelay, massive player from Archon. Hoy, another massive player from, from Navi. Kranich, Purple, Dreamhack winner. Like, there's just so many top names in this tournament. You, you missed out Life Coach. Right, yeah. yeah, exactly. This is my point. Like, yeah, uh, I... I, I, I uh, 30 minutes talking about every player here. It's just an Absolutely. insane lineup. We're going to bring you the, all of the first round matchups today, all eight matches. Uh, and, I, you know, just to hype you up a little bit, our second last match of the day is going to be Life Coach versus Purple, which I have to say is maybe the pick of the round, I think, uh, of matches that we're going to see. Two great champions going up against each other. Uh, we also have Hoy versus Jab, which is, I think is going to be a really interesting matchup as well. This is a, this is a last hero standing tournament. So we are seeing a lot of conquest, particularly in the Hearthstone Championship Tour, but this is right. four decks, one ban, last hero standing best of five what does last year standing mean as a difference to conquest um it means a lot there's there's a lot of additional in, in my opinion anyway a lot of additional layers of strategy that go into lineup building and pick order in last hero standing that are less present in conquest um conquest most of the time comes down to just bringing three solid decks or four solid decks if there's a ban there's the strategy that you can try and bully one deck out of the format in in conquest and just not let that deck win but Beyond that, it hasn't really evolved to the point that maybe some people were expecting it to do as a competitive format. Whereas last hero standing, there's just a ton of considerations. There's 
you know, lineup considerations. You want all of your decks on average to pick up like one and a half wins. It sounds weird, but that's what you want. You want your decks to be a one and a half win deck because a deck that just wins once and then can get immediately countered is kind of awkward. Um, you can go for that lineup where you have a bunch of polarizing decks and then trust that you're going to win the, the reads on the pick order to get yourself an advantage. Um, but there's a ton of different ways to go about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to like trying to get into the mindset of the players as we, as we get into things like pick order and their, their lineup construction in the later games. Do you think it's going to favor players who have maybe been around for a longer period of time? Guys like Strife Crow, maybe guys like Kranich who competed in the, the World Championships in 2014, Firebat, uh, Jab's been around a long time. Do you think they'll have that kind of advantage? Because Left Hero Stunning was a format that all but disappeared, right. but really kind of reappeared towards the end of last year. And now, I mean, PGL that's going on it is also Last Hero Standing, and yeah. people are, 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 you know, taking advantage of different formats. Yeah, I mean, it's a consideration for sure. There, there will be some players in this bracket that have more, um, more experience in in high level last hero standing tournaments. But I'm sure everyone here has extensive experience with the format. It's just whether they're quite on that level. Because, um, like I said, like getting the reads on pick order um, is a hugely important thing. So some of these players might not have the experience at that sort of level. Might not be able to make those reads. Of you know, I'm going to pick what seems to be a terrible choice first because I expect them to pick this. Um, that sort of thing. So it, it's a consideration, but I wouldn't expect it to be like a defining factor in who comes out on top of this tournament. For sure. Well, let's take a look at our first matchup and maybe talk with these players a little bit in detail. First match we're going to have today, Temple Storm's Eloise versus Dignitas's Kranich. Team Dignitas, sorry, I should say. <laughs> uh, I get in trouble if I call them just Dignitas. Team Dignitas. Uh, it's a totally different thing altogether, Dignitas. Uh, Eloise who has fast become, I think, perhaps the Hearthstone community's favorite troll in many ways. Right. Yeah. But a very talented player in our own right, has a number of uh, strong tournament performances in China. Uh, and Kranich, of course, the only player to make it to both the 2014 and 2015 World Championship Finals. Uh, what do you make of these two players? Yeah, I have a huge amount of respect for Kranich for that achievement. In my opinion, that's one of the biggest achievements we've seen in Hearthstone, um, because the way that you test consistency and quality of a player in Hearthstone is consistency over an extremely long period of time. You know, we are, we're playing a game that has a level of variance to it. So one tournament performance doesn't necessarily prove anything. Two tournament performances start to develop a pattern. But if you're an established player through the course of, an, you know, the span of an entire year to qualify for one BlizzCon and then come back and qualify for the next one, that is a massive achievement. And I can't, I don't think we can overstate how impressive that is from Kranich. Absolutely. And Eloise, as you say, you know, as I said, she has a number of tournament wins to her name as well, is a very prominent streamer now, very popular. I'm sure a lot of people in Twitch chat are going to be rooting for Eloise, uh, hoping for some maybe some memes from her. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but we're just waiting for the bans from these two players. But I can tell you they're four decks. Uh, Eloise has brought Mage, Druid, Warlock and Paladin. Kranich has gone for Druid, Hunter, Warlock and Rogue. Which is kind of interesting. No Paladin from Kranich and picking up the, the Rogue there. And he's also bringing the Hunter, which is interesting because it's a very out of favor class at the moment. Just looking at um, what I've seen of the PGL stream over the last couple of days, there's actually not a single Hunter was brought mm. to the Swiss stage of that tournament, uh, which is kind of mind blowing when you go back, you know, even six months, which is not that big of a period, but Hunter, Face Hunter, Midrange Hunter, all of these decks were considered valid. You know, Orange has had great success in a number of tournaments with Hybrid Hunter. Um, so seeing Hunter kind of push to the wayside as one of the weakest classes is um, somewhat surprising to see. But Kranich, um, well known as a Hunter player. Dignitas, well known as Hunter players. I think you uh, have to show your golden Hunter at the door to gain admission to Team Dignitas. So no surprise that he is um, favoring the Hunter here. All right, well, Kranich has banned the Mage of Eloise. I'm uh, just going to leave her with the Druid, Warlock, and Paladin. And Eloise has banned Druid. Doesn't want to face the Druid. Don't no, uh, no arguments from me on that one. And then Hunter, Warlock, and Rogue. So it's going to be the Druid, Warlock, Paladin of Eloise versus the Hunter, Warlock, Rogue of Kranich. I mean, just on face value, as you're saying, you know, the Hunter is definitely an unfavored class at this point. Rogue, you would have to say is a pretty unfavored class at this point. But I think it, it, Rogue's always in a really interesting spot in that if you're a good Rogue player, you know, it, oil Rogue is basically all you see from Rogue at this point. If you're yeah, a really good- There's a little player, bit of Malagos Rogue. There's a little okay, bit. Okay, yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of the Malagos Miracle stuff, but yeah, yeah. If, you, you know, if you're a good oil Rogue player, it does still feel like you can bring that and win with it if you're a really good player with it. 
Right, and I, I wrote an article about this recently um, that was on the subject of the, the EU preliminaries and what we saw there with you know, the unknown players, but that term is an argument in itself, apparently, um, beating all the established pros. And one of the points that I really wanted to make in that article is that skill, like high skill decks, get decks where the gap between the skill floor and the skill ceiling is big, like Rogue, if you are an experienced player with Rogue, it's almost always a good idea to bring a deck like that to a tournament because there is more room between like the acceptable level of play and the mastery level of play for you to actually outplay your opponent. So you know, if, you're, if your opponent playing averagely slots in here, you can push all the way up to here by playing the deck extremely well. Um, and that's not something that's necessarily available with more um, standard curve decks like Paladin and Midrange Druid. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, you're playing at a fairly established level, you know, the deck is a fairly consistent average thing where it does the same thing kind of consistently. There isn't that much room for you to impose yourself as a strong player. Whereas decks like Freeze Mage, Patron Warrior, Oil Rogue, you know, these, these combo heavy intricate decks, they really have the ability for people to outplay their opponent, which is why you see Freeze Mage specialists, Patron specialists, Rogue specialists always bring these decks to tournaments. I love how consistent the rogue specialists are as well, because one person in this tournament we're expected to maybe see rogue from is Firebat, for example, who is a very high level rogue player, brought it for a long time. Uh, right at the start of Conquest, rogue was very much part of his lineup. And again, it's just a, a strong deck all the way through. And I'd be interested to see Kranich and see how good his rogue play is. I haven't seen too much on the rogue from him. No, I mean, there's also the possibility that we have to at least consider that this is, um, you know, an aggressive rogue, some sort of variation of, of backspace turn six rogue, anything along those lines. You know, Kranich we know is an aggressive player, and I'm with you. I haven't seen him play a great deal of the, the combo rogues, the oil and the miracle lists. So maybe he's going to throw a curveball at us, and this is some kind of crazy aggressive tempo rogue. So what do we think we've got? We can have, we can have aggro rogue. Uh, maybe it was Agro Druid. We won't know it was Ben. Uh, Face Hunter, and then and then it gets Zoo. Is that what yeah. is that what we're doing here? Yeah, Zoo with a Leroy shoved in it, which has actually become surprisingly popular recently. I've I've played with it a little bit, and I I kind of get the benefit of it. You can afford to lose the board with that deck because you have Leroy Power Overwhelming as a finisher. Whereas when you're playing Doom Guards instead, you have to have a minion on the board in the first place to guarantee that, right? You have to jam your PO first and then Doom Guard. So you kind of have to have the board to be in that position. Um, so I get it, but I just feel like having Leroy in your deck also makes you lose the board more often than having a Doom Guard. So swings and roundabouts, right? But yeah, interesting lineups. Just looking at the bans here, we've seen, so Mage has been banned from, Eloise's Mage has been banned, Kranich's yeah. Druid has been banned. Is that correct? Correct. So interesting. I'm gonna say I haven't followed Eloise's professional career too closely. Is she known as a freeze mage player? Do we know this? Is this a known phenomenon? I haven't seen her playing too much freeze mage. I've seen her playing temple mage, so I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if that was what we've seen from her. So if Kranich has banned out the mage expecting tempo mage, it's because he wants to push his druid through primarily. I would suspect. Um, so Eloise picking up the druid ban there is means she's probably come out slightly ahead of that. If it's the other way, and he's banned Mage in fear of Freeze Mage, thinking that, you know, I have Rogue, Warlock, Hunter, these are three decks that are potentially bad against Freeze Mage. If in response to that, Eloise has banned the Druid, which is, you know, primarily in this list would be used to farm the Freeze Mage, then Kranich will have come out ahead here. So you can already, you can already see, right, the, the things that are going on, like the intricacies and the mind games of the last, time, last Hero Standing format. So we'll have to await and see what the actual lists are before we can really comment on who's come out ahead here in this ban phase. But uh, yeah. definitely a lot of potential for, for good stories either way. As, and we won't even know because we won't see what the mage was. Right, so yeah, exactly. We'll have to wait and see if Eloise gets through whether or not Kranich was, was winning or not. Yeah. Um, I think... Is, is uh, Warlock is definitely one of Eloise's favorite classes from what I've you know, seen from her in, in tournaments like ATLC. She plays a lot of Warlock, did play a lot of Handlock, but I think also plays a, a lot of Zoo. So I might expect, particularly because Zoo is quite strong right now, uh, you know, a lot, some people, it seems like Handlock isn't really being played at the moment, but it seems to be Zoo is the way to go or, or Reno Lock. Right, I believe what, there was a tournament recently, was it? Uh, yeah, it was um, Fibonacci who just brought straight up Demon Handlock to NA prelims. Um, but he, I think he even conceded that he didn't feel like, he wasn't bringing it because he felt it was better than Reno Lock. He was bringing it because he thought he was better at it than Reno Lock. Um, so you're right, Handlock is kind of a lesser light at the moment. It's been somewhat eclipsed by Reno Lock because it turns out Reno Jackson is a pretty good card. Yeah. 
I mean, everyone knew that card was going to be good, right? What people underestimated or overestimated, depending on which way you look at it, is like the impact that having 30 individual cards in your deck would have. A lot of people just thought, no, that deck would just be unplayable. It'll be too yeah. inconsistent. You'll never draw the right thing at the right time. Exactly. It turns out there's enough good cards in Hearthstone now that you can just jam 30 cards in a deck, slap Reno in there, and you, you're pretty okay. Yeah, I mean, that was being there, the, you know, for the announcement of BlizzCon, and, you know, talking to people, it was talking to people around us just as we instantly saw the cards. I mean, everyone, of course, saw Reno and thought, well, Freeze Mage, that's going to be a thing. We're right. going to see Reno Freeze Mage. And we did see that quite early on with Super JJ winning Sea Story Cup yeah. with Reno Freeze. But Reno Freeze has actually kind of fallen out of favor a little bit in favor of just normal Freeze being yeah. just a little bit more consistent. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think anyone really thought straight away that uh, that the the, the 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 Reno Highlander decks were going to be uh, that strong. Uh, just checking. I think we might have got uh, we might have a slight mistake on Eloise's lineup. Just trying to check what it is that she's playing, yeah. whether it's warrior or warlock. Uh, right. We were we were given the initial information of warlock, but we're now being told that she's picked warrior. So something something has gone wrong here. But we'll find out what it is for you as soon as possible. Are um, we yeah. wrong? Our production wrong? Is Eloise just picking whatever she likes? <laughs> Who knows? We'll find out. The Kranich is opening with the rogue. Yeah. So, I mean, if that is an oil rogue and this is, um, it, it is in fact Warrior that's coming from Eloise here and not Warlock, we're still waiting to find out. And then she will have got a very good opening matchup here. Generally, you know, Patron Warrior against Rogue is, is kind of a wash of a matchup. It can go either way, but if he's got, if she's got the Control Warrior there into an oil rogue or even an aggressive rogue, honestly, then that's going to be a pretty solid matchup for her. How do you pick the deck that you lead off with in Last Hero Standing? Because in Conquest, all your decks have to win, right? So you kind of, you pick the one that you might have the narrowest options and, it, and right. you know, you just kind of work backwards in that respect. But how do you pick off in Last Hero Standing? So it depends on, like, what level of mind games you want to go for, right? There's, there's the basic thing where you just play the statistics and you look at each of your decks, you calculate your opinion on the matchups that that deck has against each other deck in the opponent's lineup. And then you play the one with the highest total combined percentage, because that's statistically your best leadoff. Right? That's like the basic way to play it if you just want to go for the vanilla pick. But from there, you can look at your lineup and do that same thing for your opponent, and then say, okay, that means my opponent is going to pick this. And then you just pick your best hard counter for that deck first. So that's, I mean, that's just one possibility of things you can do. You can go for a hard read, you can go from tournament history. You can say, you know, I've watched this guy play with this lineup in three different tournaments already, and each time he's had this lineup, he's always led mage. Therefore, I'm, you know, he's always led freeze mage. Therefore, I'm going to pick druid as a first matchup. You know, there's so many ways that you can open this up. Um, and honestly, one of, one of the major downsides of Last Hero Standing, if there is one, is that the first game is everything. Um, so this phase here, where you pick and ban initially, is so huge. If you can get that first win on the board, you have the chance to just back and forth the rest of the way through the series, right? So you go 1-0, you get countered, you counter, you get countered, you counter, you win 3-2. All right, so just trying to get to the bottom of this, of uh, Eloise's lineup. It does say Warlock on the screen right now, but uh, we're not quite sure. We're just going to get the clarification, but obviously Druid and Paladin... Two very strong decks for Eloise, you know, you mentioned them earlier, uh, as being very consistently well-performing decks. Yeah. Uh, Druid Combo with the the imminent arrival of Standard and the changes that are coming with it. Druid Combo very much in the, uh, the minds of a lot of players right now. <laughs> yeah, something about Druid will more or less have to change, honestly, for the, for the long-term health of the game, in my opinion. Whether that's combo, I don't know, because I feel like if you make combo too weak, you're almost just outright destroying Druid. Um, so I don't know, maybe you look at Innovate, and that prevents them from getting ahead on the board in the first place, and then makes the combo less scary, because they haven't been able to get ahead of you with, with cards like Innovate and Wild Growth. Um, I don't know, but I agree with you. Something, something needs to be looked at. Druid is a problem right now. It kind of just breaks the rules of the game. Um, so yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll await standard with bated breath and hopefully it will uh, deliver us to greener pastures, Callum. Absolutely. And uh, it, I mean, standard will certainly have an impact on Secret Paladin as well. You know, a lot of people look at that and perhaps, you know, some people on Reddit might go, well, Mysterious Challenger is still going to be there, so it's Secret Paladin still going to exist. But you look at the cards that are going to disappear 
with you know shielded mini bots gonna go the haunted creeper is gonna go a number of the secrets are gonna go master for battle shredder yes. dr boom yeah there's so many but the thing you also have to consider is there is an entire new expansion of cards that is coming with the with the new format uh, this is the thing people don't consider. Like, there's all these arguments. Like, is secret padding going to be bad? Will freeze mage work? Like, they lose mad scientist, but then lower thirds also gone. But the, the like, the, the answer is you don't know. And honestly, any yeah. any any opinion that you have is actually above average to be wrong, just based on the fact that if you've noticed something about like a hole in the meta, it's like, oh, these cards are going, therefore this is going to happen. There's a there's a good chance that Blizzard have noticed that too, and will then fix it. So anything that you spot right now, not only is it kind of pointless to, to speculate about it, it's actually just way above 50% to just be completely wrong because it's the thing that Blizzard will react to with the new set. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about Rogue earlier on. Rogue is a class which can, that is going to need uh, potentially something from this expansion with oil disappearing uh, and a number of other cards in that deck. Uh, the core will still be there, of course, with Deadly Poisons and Blade Flurries and that sort of thing. But... That oil, which a lot of people marked as being bad when they first saw it. Yeah. yeah uh, I did a piece of I did a piece of work on the Daily Dot around the time that um, the Grand Tournament came out, where I looked back at all the prediction videos that top pros had made, and I think about three quarters of pro players had said uh, that the uh, had said that oh, the oil was going to be a bad card. Okay, so we go we we do have Eloise's lineup finally. Uh, it's not Warlock or Warrior, it's uh, Warlock and Warrior. Yes. Uh, and it was, in fact, Paladin, which was in there instead of Warrior. So this actually looks potentially, you know, if she is playing some kind of Reno Lock, quite a control-heavy lineup. Um, but that is, that's a, a playstyle I think we've seen from Eloise in the past. Uh, I think so, yeah. I, I've, I've seen her play in one or two high-profile tournaments, and I've seen her definitely favor control Warlocks from what I remember. Um, but yeah, just to go over our exact lineup again, just to avoid the, confu the confusion, we have Mage, we have Druid, we have Warlock, and we have Warrior. Um, so looking again, the Druid ban would make a lot of sense now that this this thing looks a lot more controlly overall, right? There's potential for that to be a Control Warrior, a Control Warlock, a Reno Lock of some variety, and a Freeze Mage. So if those three decks are in your lineup, you are auto banning Druid in pretty much every series. But equally, it would make more sense potentially if you know she is playing a control warlock for it to be a, a tempo mage rather than a freeze mage. Which and and if you're if you're Kranich looking at that four deck lineup, I yeah. think you can probably make a decent read at tempo mage there. So you know a, a decent ban from Kranich as well. Yeah, for sure. But there's also the consideration that if you look at that four deck lineup, maybe you would expect your druid to get banned because of the potential for it to be so good. And if you're expecting your druid to get banned, maybe you don't need to ban the tempo mage anymore. And this is the level of my games you can get into with last year of standing, right? As well, yeah. you know, she's gonna ban this and think because she thinks I'm gonna ban this, but I'm not gonna not ban that, so I'm gonna ban this other thing. Or she thinks that I'm gonna not ban that, so I'm gonna ban yeah. It's, so just, it's, it's an interesting point overall because there's so much kind of the literal definition of metagame, right? Outside the game, um, in Hearthstone is such a test of skill. Um, people kind of focus, they, they pick the best player from like, who's making the best plays in the game? Like, who does these crazy plays that blow our mind? You know, that, that guy must be a good player. But honestly, the standard of tournament that we have here, all 16 guys in this lineup are at a level. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I'll fill you in on what's happening here in a sec. Let me just finish this thought. Okay, oh, you finish, your, finish your thought and then I'll take the flack for telling everyone what's going on. All right, sure. So. In this 16-man tournament, all of these guys are at a very, very similar level of actual on-the-board Hearthstone play. One of the points where skill is really evaluated in this game is in your deck building. It's in your lineup construction. It's in your choice of ban. It's in your pick order. This is all the kind of stuff that people don't really appreciate enough from the outside looking in. Um, so it's something that I really like to talk about and something I try to illuminate where I can, because um, it really can be the deciding factor in a lot of tournaments where the playing field is so level like this one. Okay, Go! so we, ap we apologize <laughs> for the delay. Uh, so the, the issue with the lineups was not restricted to uh, our information. It's actually uh, the information that was given to Kranich was also wrong. So they're redoing the ban phase based on the actual lineups as opposed to the wrong lineups. It's a, this is the first Wombo tournament. It's the, uh, the first match of the day. These things always happen. So uh, we're just waiting on our guys telling us what the new ban is. And then once we've done that, we will get into the first game as soon as possible. And once we get rolling, we're just going to get rolling. And then, you know, we'll have match after match. We're still going to bring you eight 
best of fives in Hearthstone today. So you know, calm yourselves, Twitch chat. It's gonna be it's gonna be okay. Wow. We're here for you. We're here you for you. You can't tell them to preemptively calm themselves. That's just inciting riots in itself, Cal. Oh no, they're they're already they're already rioting. I chat. Right. You just can see bit. you can see into the future. Okay. No, I just I you know the uh, I, on the ten minute delay I can already see them oh, complaining about casters right. talking okay. for too long, okay. uh, and knowing that we are still here in the future, talking sure. rather than what than casting a game. So Kranich has stuck with the mage ban. Yes. Uh, in that lineup, which you know potentially makes sense based on what he's brought, and we'll see if Eloise is going to change hers. I guess. Hmm. I'm, I don't really know what's going on, guys. This will happen, but we know the lineups. We know that Kranich is going to be opening with the Rogue, and Eloise is going to be banning with the Warrior, opening with the Warrior, unless they change that as well. Yeah. What's going Every, on? Everything's side? up in the air, Callum. Um, but the Mage ban, the Mage ban from Kranich makes a lot of sense to me. I would imagine he is expecting Freeze Mage, just based on him banning that twice in a row, because Hunter, Warlock, and Rogue, um, yeah. Hunter is, it's kind of surprising to some people, but Hunter is generally a bad matchup against Freeze Mage. It seems oh, weird yeah. it really that this is. deck can output so much damage, but unless you're playing like Flare in your deck, you just have so much trouble. Like an Ice Barrier comes down early, they have too much life to burst down, they protect themselves with Ice Block, they Alex up at the end of the game, or they get that free Alex if they have you know, had a really good draw and you have no healing in your deck. Um, so you, you can have a really bad time as a hunter, and then Zoo and Rogue definitely like two decks that can potentially struggle. So I'm looking at a base hunter Zoo oil rogue list here from Kranich based on that ban, and he's banned out the Freeze Mage, expecting his Druid to get banned. Okay, so but all, everything has stayed the same. Kranich has banned the Mage, Eloise has banned the Druid, and Eloise is opening with the Warrior, and Kranich is opening with the Rogue. So nice. everything has stayed as is. We're getting into the game in just a second but yeah you're right about that freeze mage uh face hunter matchup as you say a face hunter can win that matchup if you yeah. can but if you do so you kind of have to almost win within like four turns if that makes any sense yeah you, you have can... to be in the winning position within the first four turns right like, yeah. yeah yeah exactly Frost over Doomsayer, and then you get into Blizzard and Flamestrike territory. I think you you definitely have to win by the time you get to the Blizzard turn. Yeah. Because that's when things start to fall apart. And at that point, you're just going to get stalled out so much that your opponent's going to be able to build up their burn or even just outlast the Face Hunter to, the, to when the Face Hunter has no resources left. Yeah. Um, just the natural timing of Alexstrasza heal self in that matchup. It kind of comes at the exact point when Face Hunter loses, uses the absolute last card in their hand. It's just kind of how it usually works out. Um, so healing yourself back up to 15 against a handful of nothing is uh, usually pretty solid. Yeah, and you feel in a pretty good position. I, I've said before that Face Hunter is like a mini freeze mage. In the, all right, the all right, Callum. Callum, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to explain this one. I'm waiting. Okay, okay. So, Freeze Mage is a deck which has three phases. I was taught this by uh, by TJ Sanders when we cast it together last year. It has the draw phase, the stall phase, and the burn phase. Burn phase. Face Very Hunter is exactly the same, except all it has is the burn phase. <laughs> so you have a limited amount of resources and damage that you can't do in one turn. You need to weave it over a number of turns, and you're trying to do so before your resources run out. Okay, it's the good. same as the third phase of Freeze Mage. There you All go. right. I, I could pick holes in your theory right now, but we are ready. But we have a game to watch. Dish. Yeah, we do. And it is. So it's Rogue up against Warrior here. So Eloise looks like this is a control warrior, unless she has a big game hunter teched into Patron. Um, so she will be happy with her first matchup here. Generally, in this matchup, it's just an outlast game for the control warrior. He can, uh, the warrior can just kind of afford to hit as much stuff as he wants with weapons. And the rogue player with the limited amount of minions that they have in their deck just kind of runs out of stuff. They never get to like bank an oil onto a minion because everything's getting cleared. But Eloise here, three weapons in the opening hand, probably one too many. Yeah, maybe even two too many, to be honest. But does have the accolade as well, so the minions that she has do give her options. Uh, just going for an armor up, not equipping the War Axe here. With the two War Axes in hand, do you think that that might have been a, a good idea to maybe start equipping those and just be uh, ready with it? Or... Like I said, it is an Outlast matchup, so the armor up makes sense. Also, you don't know what the first minion you're going to have to react to is in this matchup. 
Like, if they play a 3-3 on turn 3, sure, you would have loved to have, like, the tempo of the axe already developed. But there's a very, very good chance that you don't see anything until, say, Violet Teacher, where it's better to have the Death Spite equipped, so you can, you know, you can spend one swing one turn, then use this next swing the next turn to just clean up any tokens that get generated. Um, so this is fine from Eloise, just waiting to see what she has to react to and armoring up in the meantime. Yeah, good answer to this Acolyte of Pain here with the Deadly Poison, uh, and has the... The, the ability to re-dagger as well, so a fresh swing on that for next turn. Oh! Hello. There's an Elise in Eloise. In, an Elise in Eloise is Warrior Deck. Straight on turn four as well. Very good. Eloise Starseeker coming down right now. It hits go. the board, and it's just a nice curve play here just to challenge the board. No backstab in Kranich's hand, so not a particularly efficient answer to this. Well, yeah, and, this, I mean, yeah. the Violet Teacher as a vanilla 3-5 and something like, you would pick it in Arena as a 4-mana 3-5. It's definitely not a bad stat line. Right. Uh, it's, yeah, the 3-5 of Elise. And there's Revenge as well. So this could be, some, you know, you talked about this being an Outlast matchup. Mm -hmm. The Revenge and the Elise makes it seem like this is almost a, a Fatigue Warrior. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different builds of Control Warrior flying around right now. It went through a period of weakness, and as usually happens when a deck goes through a period of weakness, the real loyalists to that deck try and adapt it and bring it back. Um, so we've seen a couple of lists. We've seen Fibonacci's you know, Deathwing uh, Tournament Medic. I think it's called Tournament Medic, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, deck, we've seen a, a really low curve version that like tops out at Justicar and Shield Maiden and just plays like all the removal down the curve yeah. below that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting ways you can build this now, but Revenge, honestly, is fairly standard these days, just because the meta is so Zoo and Secret Paladin heavy, sure. and Revenge is just backbreaking against those decks. Yeah, I just, you know, you talk about innovating when Warriors Week, I remember when we were casting together back in November, uh, Zalei was playing a, a Fatigue Warrior that he was working on at that point, it was, it was his build of that with, the, I think, Double Revenge, Double Bash, and all, that, <laughs> and all those removal options. Um, but yeah, you're right, this could just be a, a very teched out version of the Warrior with the, the Baron Geddon as well, being uh, formerly the winningest card in Hearthstone. Oh really? There are the statistics that, on this? That was the thing that Ben Broad said uh, a good while ago now, but it was he, he did say in his stream recently that it's not the case anymore, but it used to be the Baron Geddon was the card that if you drew Baron, that you won them, the, the, the card that you drew in the highest percentage of winning games was Baron Geddon. Interesting. So, drew or played? Because that's an important distinction. I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember. It, might, it, might, it might have just been drew, but who knows? Okay, if it's played, that makes a ton of sense because you don't play Baron Geddon unless it's an amazing board clear on yeah. the board, right? So that makes a lot of sense, but drew would be really, really interesting to me. But anyway, getting back to the game, Kranich has a good tempo clear here with the Blood Mage Eviscerate taking down the Shield Maiden, but. He's just lacking a little bit of pressure here, and now we are going to see that big threat developed on the board. Baron Geddon comes down from Eloise, clears the board, and asks for another answer here from the Rogue. But Rogue is a deck that is generally stacked with one or two answers in their deck, Callum. Just a few, just a few. We see the Sap, we see, uh, you know, there's an Oil there and Deadly Poison and Prep if Kranich wants to get a little bit crazy. But I, I really like Baron Geddon in Control Warrior, particularly, you know, thinking back to the, the old Control Warrior days when you'd have Baron Geddon in your deck and everyone was playing one big game hunter and you were saying well here's a seven attack creature but spoilers I've probably got Gromash and Alex and Ysera in this deck as well right. so do you really want to use premium removal on a seven five also the other way around is just such a fantastic answer when you do get say you play Dr. Boom you. first and it gets big game hunter you then have Baron Geddon just to immediately slam and you can clear out the big game hunter without losing tempo just because of and the hit power. the boom bots and things happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, no, normally because you know normally it's like they hero power one of the boom bots, they do something to the other one. You're like, okay, I'm getting big game hunted. I've seen this a million times. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, Baron Geddon is a nice answer to come down just to counter big game hunter once your your first big threat gets removed. So it works both ways in that regard. We see Practice. the Belcher in Kranich's world. Belcher. It's interesting when people do how people do build rogues. I was watching I was watching Firebat play some rogue uh, earlier in the week, and he was playing uh, Shredders and Doctor Boom in his oil rogue. And it's there there are very limited minion spots in the deck, and how you pick the minions can really dictate the the playstyle and really dictate the matchups as well. And Sludge Belcher is one of those flex minion picks in the deck. Right, and it, it depends on how you tilt your matchups, really, because if you want to add these additional minions to the deck, it's normally at the cost of 
you know, some sort of removal card, maybe one fan of knives gets taken out. There's a lot of sort of individual flexible cards that you can drop. Um, so it depends whether you're trying to beat like the board floody decks, like the zoos and the secret paladins, in which case you kind of want all the removal. And you just kind of rely on like one minion, like one Drake, Prep, Fan of Knives, and then you've won the game because these decks aren't great at coming back onto the board after that swing. Whereas the more minion heavy thing with Belchers and Boom is more effective against like control warriors, mid range druids, etc., that sort of thing. Absolutely. So this Sylvanas Sludge Belter interaction, it's always a really awkward one because it doesn't. It doesn't really come off well for either player because you leave the Sylvanas in a position where your opponent can maybe work out a way to, to deal with it quite effectively. But equally, if you're the, the player with the Sludge Belcher, you can't, you, there's a very good chance you'll leave the, the slime up and then maybe your opponent's going to steal that and, you know, they are getting something, you don't deny them the complete board. So it's kind of awkward board interaction. But yeah, and we are just slowly slowly engineering into this position here from Eloise where she is one by one dealing with all the threats in the rogue deck. We've seen a Belcher go down, we've seen a Drake go down, a Violet Teacher go down, an SI7 agent go down. So we are getting to the point where Kranich is going to begin to run out of proactive threats. He does still have plenty in his hand right now, but mostly, as you can see already, the rogue hand is starting to fill up with just removal and damage. And if he can't get one or two minions to stick to the board to be able to push through some chip damage beforehand, those cards just aren't going to be enough to get the job done. Absolutely. So lots of cards in the hand for Kranich. What does he have here? He does have a second Drake and a low feb as well, so some minion options. Also Edwin as well, which uh, feels like almost like a flavor pick for some players. You know, if you, li if you like Edwin, you're going to put him in your Right, deck. yeah. Um, Blade Flayer here. This could well be an Edwin turn here. Could. He's played two cards so far, so this will end up as a 6-6 six, six Edwin. Also, he could have coined there for pretty much no reason but to add plus two, plus two. But generally in this matchup, you don't want your Edwin in range of Big Game Hunter anyway. So 6-6 six, six is kind of your sweet spot. No surprise to see it come down. And actually, there's not a particularly good answer to it right now. Uh, we can face tank six, trade the slime and play Baron Geddon. That's probably a play that Eloise is considering. Outside of that, there's some wacky plays with whirlwind effects. If you want to get it from the death spite and re-equip another weapon over the top or use the revenge alongside an acolyte maybe. But it feels like this six six is going to get some damage in here at least. And with a tinker's oil sat in hand, this could be the situation where this one minion does stick around to at least do a decent amount of face damage. And then suddenly Tinker's Oil can come through and just pu push through all the pressure, seal the game. The idea of uh, equipping the Death Spite only to replace it with a War Axe. Bash is a good pickup. Well, face tanking six sounds a lot more reasonable now. Does. Because you're only Certainly actually does. face tanking three. Bash is such a good pickup there. Yeah, there's a, it's actually... it's. When you you don't see the the lease and the path to the golden monkey that often, you sometimes forget that the map to the golden monkey draws you a card. Right. Uh, because El because the lease doesn't draw you a card, but the map does. Yes. Um, it's always a consideration about whether sometimes you have like card draw effects in your deck, and when you when you start putting these cards in your deck, you have to consider like, do I want to draw a card first? Do I want to draw a card afterwards? Like, do I want to get a card closer to the map in this matchup? Um, so it's a card where like all three individual pieces of it have its own little intricacies. Um, it's a card I wish we saw more of, honestly. I think it's a really strategic card and it's a really like high impact variance card as well that's just crazy to watch. It's kind of hard to combine those two things in the same card and they've kind of done it, which is nice. But in a lot of matchups, it's just really, really ineffective. So we, we don't see a great deal of it. Yeah, sorry, I, I was going to say before the bash came out, the idea of equipping the Death Spite to re immediately replace it with the War Axe Reminds me of a, a lesson you taught me a good while ago now, Sotl, that if a play <laughs> seems a little bit too cute, it probably yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the plays that, that comes under that heading. I think you're probably right. Um, but I love this lower third timing here from Kranich. He had yeah. a couple of turns where he could have decided to play low third. Um, but he's choosing to do it here alongside another minion to really maximize his chances that one thing stays on the board. And one thing staying on the board is pretty much all he needs right now because he has coin tinkers tinkers to follow it up. Yeah, the shield main was a good pickup for Eloise to uh, mitigate some of the damage that is going to be coming in. And that 1-2 slime is causing a little bit of a problem as well. But he has so much damage for Kranich here. How close is he? It's lethal. 
Each each Tinkers is a fireball, essentially. So backstab or sap into Tinkers. Tinkers is exactly 18. And he has the coin SI7 agent that he can put on top of that as well for even more damage. So wow. that is going to be game one for Kranich. And this no is a really, really important point for Kranich because winning an unfavored matchup is huge in last hero standing. So him going out to a 1-0 lead here in a matchup that most of the time he's expected to lose is a huge victory for him. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's and it's even more impactful than in conquest, uh, because in conquest, when you win one deck, when you win a matchup you weren't expecting to win, it can potentially negatively impact your lineup because you were expecting to line that deck up against another deck later on. Because once you win with a deck, you effectively there's a little bit of a disadvantage in that that deck is now no longer available to you. Yeah, there's, uh, there's there's no such thing as a bad win in Conquest, but there are wins that aren't important. There's wins yeah. where you are going to win with that deck anyway. But yeah, as you said, in Last Hero Standing, it's much, much better because it puts you in charge of that counterpick. Win the first game, and then you just, you get countered, you counter, you get countered. Not only have you won the first game, you also won against one of your potential counters, which reduces your opponent's options to start the chain. All right, so Eloise moving on to the Druid here to respond to the Rogue. Uh, a good answer, in your opinion, Sossel? Uh Depends who you talk to. If you talk to Rogue players, this is the easiest matchup in the world. You just draw Violet Teacher Prep every game, you play that on turn four, and you win 99% of the time. Uh, in the real world, I would probably say it's maybe 51, 52% Druid favored. Very, very slight edge. Um, but looking at the rest of her lineup, what else does she have left? Her mage was banned. So, so she's just looking warlock. at warlock or druid. So, hmm, it's interesting. If the warlock was a control warlock, I think I would have favored that over the druid. So maybe it's a zoo that she's packing. Yeah, well, we'll see that potentially later on here. Uh, are we going for a turn one shredder here? Is that a thing? Turn, turn one, one shredder. shredder. Yeah, turn, turn one wild shredder. Growth. Yep, yeah. turn one shredder, wild growth shredder. This is the cathartic point of playing druid. When you look at a hand like this, and you say, yeah, I see the curve. I see how this works. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna get this shredder out. And it's... then you're gonna take two turns to kill it, and I'm gonna go, oh look, another shredder. There you yep. go. Oh dear. Well, I mean, Eloise can deal with the first part of the shredder here, with backstab and the uh, the hero uh, power. Cr Cranich can, right? Sorry, Cranich, yes. Yep. Just making sure that I wasn't confused. Uh, so yeah, again, she's to backstab hero power and then look at maybe either fan of knives or re hero power and deadly poison on turn three to try and answer the other other part. Doesn't even need to do any of that. Just a nice one one comes out that isn't threatening at all. But wild growth from Eloise into the second shredder is going to come down here. And mind control tech gets drawn, Callum. Yeah, another tech card from Eloise. The second deck we've seen from her in a row, which definitely has some cards which are not standard issue, if you like. Uh, she's, yeah. she's, and you know, this even perhaps gives you a greater impression that she's planning for Paladin. Uh, exactly. Mind Control Tech very good against Paladin, Baron Geddon, Revenge, and Kranich isn't bringing Paladin. Right. Does look like he's, it's suspicious that he's bringing Zoo. He does have the Warlock deck, so Zoo might be likely from him. And again, these same cards would have been very effective in that matchup, but hard to say, like, based on, on Eloise's um, meta, I guess, it's hard to say that Mind Control Tech is uncommon, because honestly, in the Asian meta, Mind Control Tech and Druid is actually very, very common. Um, so it's it's probably not unsurprising, but as you said, definitely a lineup that is targeted a little bit towards beating the, the board flooding early minion decks. You mentioned the Asian meta and the, and the Chinese meta specifically, because that's a little bit different even in itself from the, the wider Asian meta. Um, one thing that in the West has really cycled out of Druid is Darnassus Aspirant, or maybe one Darnassus Aspirant. A lot of people just kind of thought, suddenly realized, why do I keep letting myself draw this in the late game? This is right. really upsetting. Oh, uh, it's turn 10 and I drew a river crop. Great. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cycled out of a, a ton of Druid decks in the West, but actually in China, it really, uh, at least I haven't cast anything from China for about a month. There hasn't been any kind of major events, but the last major events about a month ago, D Double Darnassus was still in every Druid list. Interesting. I think we're actually getting to the point again in the West, in EU and Asia, where it's starting to sneak its way back in again. You know, Fireback gave a really, really great speech about this on, on stream, where he articulated a lot of the same things that I was thinking at the time. I took Aspirin out of my deck around the same time that Firebat did, and then was like, oh, hey, Fire Firebat's doing this. It's probably right. Um, but he gave this great speech about how it's a card that you, it's a card that's only good when people aren't expecting it. So as soon as the meta says Darnus's Aspirant doesn't exist, 
put Donna's Sassaran back in your deck and then you win the tournament, right? Which is just a really great analysis of kind of the fluctuating meta. I want to talk about this choice here uh, from Eloise, going for the the silence on the Edwin rather than the damage and the trade with the the 2-2. Two -two. Uh, wait, you want to damage it and Wrath, potentially? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this develops another minion on the board, right? So in terms of sure. tempo, this is an improvement. Uh, you could have Wrathed it, traded, and played Mind Control Tech. So your board would have been 3-3 three, three against nothing rather than 2-4, two, 2-2 two, two against 2-2, two, two, plus the face damage. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm fine with her being aggressive here. You would have had the silence for the voucher though, which is uh, a little bit upsetting now in hindsight. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of the two silence effects, she got more value out of her silence this way, honestly. She she reduced the board by plus two, plus two. Just silencing a voucher, it's still there as a 3-5. It's still able to impact the board. Obviously, it's a great silence target, especially when you're being aggressive with Druid with a Savage Roar in your hand. But overall, I think it's hard to pass up silencing that ever. Yeah, I think it's, it's a pretty decent heads up play from Elise to, to recognize that she has a Savage Roar. So the potential for some, from, some kind of Savage who? Roar play. From, from, El from Eloise. <laughs> I said yeah, Eloise. Eloise. You, you said Elise. Did I? Oh, yeah. Okay. We don't want to get into, into wreckful territory here, Callum. Let's be careful. Hey, at least I'm going to call a red girl's name each yeah. time. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, for Eloise to, know, to you know, obviously recognize she has a Savage Roar in hand, hasn't drawn a Force of Nature yet, but, but just filling the board, being aggressive, and then being able to Savage Roar for a bunch of damage for if you've got like four minions on the board already is a, a very, very potential out as a Druid. Sometimes you don't even need Force of Nature or Savage Roar. One or other will do in a lot of situations. Right. And Eloise here looking at a situation where Dr. Boom is green, and honestly, the, the Boom is green meme has kind of lost its impact as time's gone on. A lot of times, investing your whole turn just in Dr. Boom can sometimes lose you a game if your opponent has the big game hunter to be able to swing back. Uh, it's an important thing about tempo, about not investing all your tempo into one card when you're ahead, because that's what gives your opponent the opportunity to swing back. But in this situation, against Rogue, Rogue lies in bed at night and cries having nightmares about Dr. Boom. So if Boom is green in this matchup, you play Boom. Oh, there's the Blade Flurry pickup. Could be nice here. I mean, it doesn't deal with the Doctor Boom. You can deal with everything except uh, the Boom, he doesn't. He doesn't have the mana, is the problem. Um, unless you just yeah, want to raw Blade Flurry with the Dagger, but that doesn't really do too much. Um, the, the Dagger up, Tink Royal Blade Flurry is going to be 8 mana. No prep, no way to, to cheat out some extra mana here. So the Blade Flurry probably isn't too much of an option. Although Dagger... Dagger up Blade Flurry SI. Yeah, that's does, that's actually, that's actually the line I was looking at. Yeah. It does get leave, the job I see done. you would leave you would leave the, the boom itself, but you would clear everything else on the board. Uh you would clear the boom as well as long as your Drake lives to attack. Oh sure, yeah, I mean you can trade. Uh but the play play that you make would clear the rest of the right. board. Right, right, right. Um and yeah, you have the flurry and then SI just with the, the dagger. Yeah. So if the Drake lives here. And the slime lives as well, which is actually really, really awesome for Kranich because he now has that additional taunt protection while at 14 health. So actually uh, worked out pretty well here. Good recognition to, to spot the board clear. Gets a little bit of luck from the boom bot, not only not killing the drake, but also not killing the slime. So suddenly Kranich is looking in a pretty solid position. Uh, yeah, a, a great swing back. You'd, you know, as you say, playing the Dr. Boom the whole turn gives your opponent an opportunity right. to fit together something and swing back. It's almost like you know what you're talking about, Sato. Sometimes. Lower Sometimes. Thefts here. I, sorry, I've been told I have to stop saying Lower Thefts. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. You and Blackout, the only people who say Lower Thefts. Yeah, all right. So Twitch chat, every time I say that, I give you permission to spam L-O-W-E-R Feb in chat until I stop doing it, okay? We'll get it out of my system. So Low Thefts being drawn that turn is actually a really, really important draw for Eloise. Not only because it's just a great play against Rogue in general, but look at the state of Kranich's hand right now. Before that deck hand was picked up, it's just four spells. Yeah, it's uh, very impactful to play Lothab against Rogue at the best of times, but when your opponent has almost literally nothing to do as a result, a seven mana Eviscerate is all you can do. And throwing that deck hand away uh, to activate the Eviscerate, because again, there's nothing else you can do. Um, and that's just going to get cleaned up by rats. So that takes nice. away some combo potential with these, oh. uh, these tinkers. <laughs> that draw chain, though. Wrath cycle into Drake cycle into Law cycle. That is insane. And we are very, very likely to see 
a force of nature picked up very soon to go into Eloise's hand here. So Kranich is going to have to find some additional answers here. Sprint, good card to pick up some additional answers. A Vis comes down, deals with the Drake, but still, any time Force of Nature comes out, we're staring at Lethal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, can we talk about this? And seeing the two Savage Wars in hand, Eloise was thinking, do you know what would be really nice? If I could draw some of my card draw cards here. <laughs> and Hearthstone was just like, sure, let's give you five draws and four of them be your draw engines. Uh, five out of six, right? Wrath, double Drake, double Law out of six. Yeah, sorry, yeah, five out of six. Yeah. Six crazy. cards in all, five of them draw cards. Okay. Druid yep. things. This is this is what we were talking about earlier. Is people a lot of people talk about the combo, but Ancient of Lore is a thing. Is a beast. And yeah. Inner Vein is a beast. Ancient of Lore, Inner Vein, and other cards in Druid are just as destructive. Ancient of Lore is one of the few seven drops in the game that when it's turn seven and you have that and Doctor Boom, you pause. Sometimes you think about it occasionally yeah. for a no, fraction of a second, plus, and then you play Boom anyway. I'm, saying, I'm not saying you don't play the boom most right. of the time. Yeah. You, you have to think about it. Yeah. Oh, oh, the swipe off the top there on the Violet Teacher as well. Uh, but is it? Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's it's lethal. Double Savage yeah. Swipe. It just ends the game. It's going to be, yeah, 12 exact lethal with the hero power of the swipe. Swipe just seals it. Yeah. So your, your excitement for the swipe was well placed, but it turns out if it was getting cast anywhere that turn, it wasn't getting cast at the Violet Teacher. But just the hero power is enough to do the last point of damage. No BM swipe from Eloise. And she is going to tie up the series now, one game to one, rewarded for her Druid pick. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, swipe is pretty much expected in every Druid deck, but it is worth saying in Last Year we're Standing that protecting information from your opponent is something you do have to consider. And in Conquest, if you win, uh, you know, you don't have to play the deck again, so right. it doesn't matter what your opponent sees. But if you can stop your opponent seeing a particular tech card or a particular second copy of something, you know, it's worthwhile keeping cards in your hand rather than just BMing and playing stuff because it's funny. If you have <laughs> that, you know, a little bit concealed information going into your next game. Yeah, it's an exact flip of the situation that you see in Conquest. In Last Hero Standing, the onus is on the player that, yeah, if, the, if, if a game is over, the onus is on the player that is losing the game to stretch it out for as long as possible and try and get your winning opponent to just play as many additional cards as possible so that you have maximum inf information. In Conquest, that situation is completely reversed because the winning deck goes out of the format. So it's actually better to concede immediately as the losing deck in Conquest rather than play additional cards. And there, there are some players who take that to the... Sixo is one player who does take that to the extreme, you know. If he's in a... he's If he's in a position even at like 20 health, but he's almost certainly lost the right. matchup, yeah. then uh, Sixo will sometimes concede that early just to protect information or maybe just to get out of a bad matchup and not stress himself out with losing that. But Karanich is going to move on to the Warlock here. So it's going to be the Druid of Eloise and the Warlock of Kranich. Does the pick into the Druid tell you anything about Kranich's Warlock deck, potentially? It makes it pretty goddamn unlikely that it's anything but Zoo, because you are not going to pick a Control Warlock into Druid. There's just no way, unless your other deck is completely awful against Druid, like Freeze Mage or something. You are not picking Reno Lock, Hand Lock, any of that stuff into Druid, and it looks like Dark Peddler, Power Overwhelming, not too much of a giveaway. Abusive Sergeant tilts towards Zoo a little bit, but still not completely identifying. But I was, I was just going to say... I'm going to put my neck on the line right now and say that this is a... Well, we still have literally no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's Zoo. It has to be Zoo. Just it has to be Zoo. Zoo. Double Implosion. There we go. Confirmed okay. Zoo. All right, we did it. Uh, but yeah, that, that was... Whoa, that was hang on a minute. I'm just, while we were trying to work out whether this was Zoo or a control deck, Kranich mulliganed away Dark Peddler from his opening hand. And abusive as well. And abusive, which I can get on board with. You know, you want to get Flame Imps, Void Walkers even would be better than abusive for turn one. But Dark Peddler is an early game curve in one card on its own. Like, it's yeah. a two drop or it can be a three drop. Like, you just get so much security in that one card. So. And you replaced it with low feb implosion and dark, right. Right? right? That's not. That doesn't feel like you've traded up in any way. And now, I mean, it's turn three, and no one's done anything, so Kranich not too much of a punish there. Does get the gang boss down, um, and I'd assume we'll just see the the shade 
at yeah, least. Yeah, this, this lack of early pressure could end up being a problem here, though, because we see the Shade come down now, and we have the option of Coin Druid of the Claw or the uh, Keeper if it has a good target next turn. So the fact that the Zoo wasn't able to just get a couple of minions down on turns one and two and start beating away means that they now don't have that really big board just to be able to power overwhelm into things all the time and you know clear out Druid of the Claws for free with a Death Rattle minion. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of pressure relinquished from that mulligan from Kranich, but he was obviously wanting to be greedy, looking for very specific cards. Um, probably Flame Imps, Knife Jugglers, the really aggressive stuff, as well as the early Death Rattle minions. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty good hand from Eloise here. I mean, the Shredder pickup is excellent. Uh, you know, gives it the curve into Shredder, Druid of the Claw, Coin Ancient of Lore. But there's also the combo in hand already. So if you're Eloise, you can just kind of control the board, make sure you're doing enough damage to face, and you can win this inside nine turns quite comfortably. And the slow start for Kranich on the Warlock, the double implosion actually isn't necessarily going to do him very much good here. Doesn't want to play the Lothab at this point. It's a bit of a tough situation. It is, and Implosion was a possibility that turn for sure, but he's looking at his board right now and saying, this is already a pretty good swipe in a lot of worlds for my opponent. And sure. this, is, this is kind of what you want to do as the Zoo player, is get the swipe out of the hand, and then you can refill with Implosion afterwards. Um, but like you said, the Druid hand here from Eloise is looking pretty good. She'll be pretty happy with the hand, but the job of the Zoo player is to put on enough pressure, like Kranich has done this turn, so the cards like Force of Nature have to be used defensively. Cards like Ancient of Law have to heal. You want to take away those like optimal possibilities from your opponent, make them have to use these hugely oppressive cards defensively so they don't gain as much of an advantage of it, and then you can push through. Um, so Eloise will have to decide here what she wants to do with her turn. Looks like Keeper is going to come down. I'd expect a Coin Hero power to come out alongside this. I'll play the Wild Growth instead so she can Law next turn, which I guess is fine too. Yeah, this is... Uh... The coin, coin the Wild Growth now, as opposed to keeping the coin for next turn, feels like a pretty good trade, because it's just coin for the next four turns, rather than coin for one turn now. Mm -hmm. so um, the Wild Growth pickup was good. So she's giving herself the option of, say, Druid of the Claw Hero Power next turn, Ancient of Law next turn. Still has the flexibility to cast that Force of Nature defensively next turn if she'd like to. Um, gonna, gonna go ahead and relinquish the, the, the Shade Greed here and just accept that it needs to pick up a trade to, to relieve some of the pressure on the board. Well, there's a Voidwalker, but five turns too late for Granite. Right, yeah. Do you Implosion? I think, you know, Implosion is an option for the Shade here. Or you could trade and keep the Implosion, as we discussed, for the, the Swipe refill. It looks like that's going to be the, the choice here. Two... Okay, using the, the Spiders. Is that to try and bait a Swipe? Well, he's maxing out on power on the turn that his opponent can't swipe because you've just played the sure. Lothab. So this is this is the point where you're safe from swipes. You might as well max out on power this turn just to have maximum uh, trading possibilities, maximum pressure on the board. So doing it that way makes a lot of sense here. But Lothab was played into Druid's turn 7, which usually isn't a turn that you're going to lock out too many spells because they just want to slam a 7 drop most of the time. So, Doctor Room is green, but you would need to clear some of the board before you could play it. Don't think that'll be too much of a problem, but what are you looking at for Kranich here? Do you want to trade your Lotheb into the 5-5 five five here, or do you want to maybe protect that as one of the the few large minions you're going to be able to have in your deck? I think I mean, just uh, the there's a few ways to do this. I'd like to trade Lotheb into the 2-3, Lotheb into the 2-3, and play Doctor Boom. Uh, there isn't enough space on the board for that, so he might choose to trade in the little guys and just have the big Lothab and the Boom in play, and I would expect he's going face here. Yep. Why not? Face feels good. There is the swipe. I didn't have that when he needed it. Um, it can potentially get some work done here. Big Game Hunter swipe one mana short of the hero power to be able to finish off the Lothab. So, a little bit awkward. Uh, the big game hunter probably gets used for sure here. The problem is finding that two mana to use your hero power so that you can get the five fives to trade as well. Um, if you if you uh, allocate that mana to the hero power, you don't really have anything else you can follow up with afterwards. Uh, so it's like swipe face is happening here. And then we're just gonna get the big game hunter alongside and trade the, yeah, this makes sense. I like this a lot. Some good boom bots there as well, leaving the the Ancient of Lore five four. If he did want the option to keep it alive, if Eloise did want the option to keep it alive, mm -hmm. uh, there's the Sea Giant. Have we seen 
Doom Guards yet? I don't know if we have, so maybe this is the the Sea Giant Leroy version that you were talking about earlier on. And speaking of talking about earlier on, there we see, even with two implosions in hand, Kranich did not cast a single one until he saw the swipe come down. And now he just has the immediate board refill back with a, a decent amount of pressure on the board, but looking a little bit puny in the face of a 7-7 Dr. Boom. Yeah, and at this kind of turn with Druid, Dr. Boom becomes all the more deadly because it provides three more targets for Savage Roar. Right. So the amount of damage that Ooh. the do a Dr. Boom on the board plus Force of Nature Savage Roar can do is huge, but there's a Dire Wolf. Is that going to help him clear up this board a little bit? Interesting that he decides to tap. I think he may have been able to play his whole hand there. Uh, the implosion would end up with a zero mana or a one mana sea giant a lot of the time. So he would have far. Yeah, he could have played his entire hand that turn, used the implosion on the Doctor Boom and used his imps to trade. The power overwhelming always get, already gets the job done, but it means that a boom bot gets left alive. But I guess, again, he's kind of scared of how backbreaking maybe second swipe would be in this situation if he went all in. Hard to say, though, because you still have that AA on the board, so... Yeah, I mean, Dark Peddler is also a good card. I mean, yeah, the, the hand of Dark, Dark Peddler and Poss Impulsion, if, if Kranich decides to keep it, is a, a very good hand to refill the board, right? Because you fill it with 1-1s, one a 2-2, two -two, and a 1-drop. So you get, right. you know, a minimum of four oh. minions going the board. But there's the Reliquary Seeker. Reliquary Seeker of um, Peddler is one of my favorite things in the game because never... Let's just pause for a moment here, Callum. I'll finish that thought in a second. <laughs> because okay. that is the mind control tech that we've forgotten about. We talked at length about how uh, how good this, this tech card is against Paladin and Zoo. Eloise has not drawn one yet. Maybe one, maybe two in the deck. We have seen Shade as well, which kind of suggests there's only one. But this mind control tech top deck here means that there is a chance that that 8-8 eight eight now belongs to her. It is in fact a 1 in 4 chance. Very good. Go for it. Let's see how lucky Elise is. Oh! Oh! Yep. Wow. So eSports. So eSports, it's in fact F Sports. That's, uh, that's our first eSports moment of the day. <laughs> Uh, but the point I was going to make was Reliquary Seeker of um, Dark Peddler is always like one of my favorite things to get because you always look at it, right? Whenever Seeker comes up, you always no. press the hide button. You look at your board and like, ah, am I going to get a 5-5 five -five here? I think in that situation, Kranich, right, Kranich was pretty confident that he was going to end up with a 5-5, five -five, but the mind control tech comes out and, spoilers, he ends up with a 5-5 five -five anyway. Yeah, we just play the, de the Defender of Argus and... There is a 5-5 five five Reliquary Seeker. I have to say, say the first time I've ever seen that in a game that I've casted, a 5-5 five five Reliquary Seeker. Uh, I've seen a fair few of them. Um, I believe this has to be lethal, yeah. Eloise immediately snaps the combo. I haven't counted it, but just the mere fact that there is that Sea Giant there getting Savage Roar means that enough damage has to be put through here. Yep, looks like 22 goes face in the end. 22 is 20, a big 28 combo. total damage. More than enough. So Eloise jumps up to a 2 1 lead over Kranich, and Kranich is going to have just his mage? Not mage. What's the other class that he's playing? It's the hunter. Hunter! Yes. Which we, be we would believe is the face hunter because Dignitas things. Yeah. Uh, so, popular opinion from you know, a lot of average Hearthstone players is that face hunter kind of beats up on Druid quite badly. Um, but it's kind of a, it's, it's because it's harder to play from the druid side than it is from the hunter side. That's not to say that hunter is an easy deck. It's just that particular matchup you have to understand as druid when it's time to stop clearing things, right? Um, you have to really like bank on that savage raw draw, even if you don't have it in your hand and be aggressive. Um, so this is potentially another good matchup from Eloise if she's experienced in the matchup. And of course, assuming this is a face hunter from Kranich, there's the possibility of mid range. Um, even if it's hybrid, by the way, I'm, I'm starting a movement, okay? Hybrid hunter as a term no longer exists. It's just face hunter, all right? I, mean, I don't have, care. Wizard approved casters. So. I don't care if you have high mains in your face hunter deck. If you have wolf riders in your hunter deck, or argent horse riders, or arcane golems, you are playing face hunter, all right? Be honest okay. with yourself. Don't lie to yourself or the or the public. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean to be fair, Blackout did pull that on me once at a Gigacon. 
I spent the whole time in a match talking about how black, and you know, that's not even just any member of Dignity. That's that is Blackout, who plays Face Hunter. I would think almost as much as any member of Dignity. Yeah. And uh, he brought Mid Range Hunter. Didn't work for him, but you know, I think he finished top four in that tournament. But yeah, he brought the Mid Range Hunter rather than the Face Hunter. Um, for, I guess for in some ways for an element of unpredictability, but also just because of how you felt about Face Hunter at the time. Uh, but yeah, I, I would feel like I feel like if you're playing Hunter right now, you are playing Face Hunter. Um, talking about the China tournaments that I was casting before, uh, one of the tournaments I was casting in that was the uh, Hearthstone Team Story League, which uh, follows the same kind of format as Archon Team League. It's a three v three six deck right. thing, but there's also uh, a one v one v one best of five. So each team brings nine decks every week, and they have to bring one for each class. Right. And pretty much without fail, every team brought Face Hunter every time. Interesting. So there is a Lepanome alongside a Freezing Trap and a Lotheb. So this is, quote, Callum, this is the last time you'll hear me say it, Hybrid Hunter, by the looks of things. Um, but it's a face deck, let's be real, that's where your damage goes. Um, so again, Eloise is going to have to find the turn where she can assess that she's ahead on board and therefore not interested in trading anymore and she needs to be the one to turn on the aggression at some point in this game if she's going to have any hope of winning yeah looking at mulligan from eloise double swipe was there do you think eloise maybe uh, she did pause for a little second and swipes quite an attractive prospect against any kind of aggressive deck right that's going to be able to to clear up some damage in a couple of turns do you think there was merit to keeping one of them I mean, it's it's a devastating card against the minions in the deck because, you know, all the Argent Horse Riders, potentially Wolf Riders, even though that's mostly been phased out, Lepanomes, Creeper Tokens, Hounds, etc. All these things get absolutely annihilated by Swipe. Uh, the problem is, I think Eloise recognizes that you need to start building a board as the Druid as early as possible because you want to be able to make that switch where you are the aggressor as early as possible. The longer you have to wait to do that by spending entire turns casting Swipe, then the further, the longer it takes you to get ahead in the game. So I think Eloise accurately recognized that she needed to look for Innovate, for Keepers of the Grove, for Wild Growth Shredder, like any of this stuff that lets you get on the board quickly. And yeah, as you say, the board being developed, the shade coming down, and there's a Keeper of the Grove for turn four, which can either kill or silence this mad scientist, depending on what Eloise wants to do or whatever else comes down. Uh, does give you a lot of options here. What do you think of the, the potential options for Eloise with the Keeper of the Grove next turn? Yeah, it's always taxing to do this sight unseen. I've already seen the freezing traps in Kranich's Mulligan, so sure. it, I, I have that knowledge. If, if I'm aware that it's freezing trap inside that mad scientist, it's probably better overall to silence it than kill it. Um, because freezing trap essentially represents a dead minion on your side of the board. You do not have time in this matchup to replay a minion that gets frozen, unless it's a minion of your choosing. Um, so Eloise, from her perspective, has to kind of make a read on what she expects here. But now that abusive sergeant has come down, she might even just decide that shooting down the abusive is the best play. Because then if Kranich wants access to his secret, he has to sacrifice damage by trading the mad scientist. Yeah, definitely an option to consider for Eloise here. As you say, this is, this is a very difficult matchup to play as the Druid, because you have to be both defensive and board controly and aggressive almost at the same time. Uh, and that, that's how you beat Face Hunter, right? Is you just kill whatever they put out and hope that they don't still just have enough damage because sometimes sometimes they do because Face Hunter. Um, but you also have to be aggressive on yourself and develop your own board, not trade away your minions too quickly. Right, I've, I've glossed over it a couple of times, but in, in really simple terms, you can't just play removal every turn because they'll play a charge minion, they'll hit you in the face, you spend your turn removing it, they play a new charge minion, they hit you in the face. So it, that is a spiral that ends up with you losing the game. At some point, you you have to pass up the removal option and say, okay, I'm just going to play a bigger minion than that minion that you have in play, and then next turn I'm going to hit you in the face if you don't trade. And picking the exact turn where that is correct is the real like skill defining thing in this matchup revealing the shade for eloise to take out the mad scientist after it being silenced it's i say you know we could see the shade dying right now uh, it was very likely the shade wasn't going to survive to the next turn so that losing that element of board control uh was there an argument to keeping the shade stealth i know you're a big proponent of uh shades being unstealth i am yeah um i don't i don't mind the the the, the reveal there i think <laughs> 
greed is a very nice way to get yourself killed against face hunter in these situations when you're behind so i'm i'm totally okay with her just revealing the trade it, it, it picks up a, a decent amount of value on the board straight away reduces the amount of damage and puts her in a position where she can develop that druid of the claw at least in a way that she probably feels is, is fairly unchallenged this turn but speaking of unchallenged the high main coming down for kranich not sure how Elvis is going to be able to deal with that, uh, other than a lot of trading. Well, how master as well. Extend that thought process to its natural conclusion. The answer to I don't see how I deal with that is I don't. I play Emperor and I hit him in the face. And actually, that you know, the Houndmaster in hand for Kranich will increase the power of this high mean, but actually doesn't really do anything for for Kranich. All the, because the taunt's in the way and it plays into big game hunter, so yeah. I mean, I do that in the creeper. I put it in simple terms just then of like it didn't seem nice to try and deal with this board, so just play emperor and go face. But on a more complex level, look at her hand right now. So she's now established herself in a position of aggression to an extent. And now, say how master came down to punish, she has big game hunter. Say a couple of minions come down to punish, she has mind control tech to potentially steal the high main. So she's actually in a really good position here to demand answers from her opponent. And there you go, two huge burst damage cards unleash the Hounds and Kill Command, having to be used for ball control. And now she's in a position where she can potentially make some stuff happen. But unfortunately, Kranich made the one play that didn't play into either Big Game Hunter or Mind Control Tech. Yeah, and so the, the, there is the option with the Living Roots and the Hero Power. If you want to be a little bit risky, to then activate the mind control tech but that feels like you're taking a lot of damage there I mean, you can yeah you can't heal as well as doing that so you would you would take five damage you'd go down to eight and you'd be able to have the two two and potentially another two two so you'd be staring down six damage with potential for two damage coming out of the hand very readily from the the, the hunter so i don't think you can deal with the high main in that way Right, and this is just very awkward. She is staring at a high main on the board, so she's got the message that this is the list with a bit more board focus. There is things like Lothab in this deck, probably, so it, it does draw damage a little bit less consistently than a pure outright face hunter deck. Um, and again, there we go. Eloise doesn't respect the 1 1, establishes herself as the aggressor, but that Unleash the Hounds top deck from Kranich is absolutely massive. It has so much damage potential. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. There's a Houndmaster as well. When one of these Hounds dies, because the board is currently full, uh, Houndmaster can make one of those a 3-3, three, three, and then that's a lot of damage. But the trades here from Kranich, I guess, res you know, respecting the potential for something crazy like double Savage Roar. Right, also Emperor has been cast, so full combo is definitely a possibility on the following turn. So he does need to, to play around death on the backswing a little bit. Um, respects the trades just enough, puts himself in a position where he comfortably has lethal if there isn't a, a, a significant answer to this board. But speaking of significant answers, got the hound. Okay. <laughs> is, it's, is that I, good? It's okay. It's probably the second best outcome. It's better than the Houndmaster because it has charge, but pretty sure she just wanted the high main that turn. I mean, yeah, of course she wanted the high main. That's not, yeah. That doesn't really feel like something we can debate. To be well, honest. High main doesn't have charge, Callum. So it's not strictly better in this situation. Mm. I always feel like charge minions off mind control tech are a spoiler. Or like charge minions in general, like um, armored warhorse. If you play it in arena, you immediately know whether you've won the joust or not, because it goes green. Right. Um, so yeah. A little bit a little bit of spoilers there. Blizzard, please fix. Come on. <laughs> There's the, the wild growth in there, I guess potentially looking at more combo shenanigans, I don't know. But yeah, yeah the, the silence was enough. Kranich to take this wow, game, you hear a little smile, smile on the face of Kranich. <laughs> Rips the owl. Was that his only out? No, Eagle Hornbow would have been an out as well. But he, if he'd have drawn Quick Shot or Kill Command, he wouldn't have had enough mana to play them alongside the hero power. So very, very limited outs there under the low Lothab conditions to actually get lethal. Yep, playing through the low feb to get the equalizing game there. So it's two to two. It's going to be Hunter versus the Warlock of Eloise, right? 
Uh, yes, I believe so. We have not seen Eloise's Warlock as of yet. So yeah, those are the two decks remaining. Hunter up against Warlock. And this can go in a variety of different ways, Kevin. Depending on the variety, which of the variety of ways Eloise has gone. Exactly. The building of the Warlock deck. Right. We've already seen Face Hunter from Kranich, so that removes a lot of the variables, but obviously flexibility... <laughs> Stop! It's Face Hunter! <laughs> Stop laughing! Um... Oh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, this this is like when you when you tried to get combo druid changed to being fast druid, right? But it, it, people do generally call it mid range druid now. So my yeah, my my objection druid rather fast druid. My objection was the combo druid part because See. like it, the 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 naming used to be combo druid and ramp druid, and ramp druid usually had the combo in it, and combo druid plays ramp. So what do the names tell you, right? So I just like like fast druid and wall druid was the way I used to do it, but I'm fine with mid range druid. That's cool. We can go with that. Anyway, good talk, Callum. Thank you. Okay, so your face hunter, yeah, it's gonna go up against uh, essentially zoo. Let's see. Yeah, if it zoo is what Kranich will be hoping because that's probably Ooh. the best matchup he can get. Although he doesn't have the explosive traps, we saw freezing and snake as his trap suite. Um, so that's a little bit weaker against Zoo, but it looks like this is some variety of Reno Lock from Eloise. No great information yet about whether it's a, a, a Wombo Combo deck or a, um, a more control-heavy deck with, um, with additional late-game minions. Right, I was casting with Falcone on his uh, Showtime show earlier this week, and we um, Nevs was playing against one of the viewers, and he was playing the, the Reno Lock with the, the combo, and the combo was like bottom five cards of the deck nice uh, i think he drew, he drew the faceless maybe in the first like six cards and then didn't draw the leroy or the power overwhelming until the bottom five cards um yeah this looks like a version of arena log here is the molten giant we did see uh the bran as well so many yeah. different choices you can make with this deck and we, and we see a couple of them here the molten giant and the refreshment vendor yeah, just, just naturally because of the style of the deck. You have 30 individual cards, so there's more card slots to fight for. So you have a greater number of decisions to make about your total getup. Um, but also just decisions in the archetype of the deck. Do you want to go outright control? What tech cards do you want to play? Do you want to play the combo so that you're better against other control decks? There's all these kind of decisions that are going in. And seeing the Refreshment Vendor and the Molten Giant, I would suspect that there isn't a charge combo in this deck. Um, normally, like, the, the deck doesn't play Moltens. You can sometimes get one Molten snuck in there, but the Refreshment Vendor as well is another uncommon card in that kind of list. So if I was going to put my neck on the line here, I'd say this is just a, a straight-up control list and doesn't feature the Wombo combo, which is actually what you want against aggro decks most of the time. Molten is pretty great here, poten uh, potentially for Eloise. I mean, when you're playing Handlock against Face Hunter, the trope was that you have to kill your opponent as the face hunter. You have to kill your opponent before they can play double molten Argus. Yes. Um, obviously, double molten not a threat that's available here, but molten giant still going to be a, a, a huge wall for uh, the hunter to get through if she can pick up a taunt giver here to go with it. Um, but a couple of nice cards lining up here. The acidic swampoos can come down against the eagle horn bow when it comes, and it looks like that's coming this turn. On top of that, Mind Control Tech looks like it may pick up some value in the near future, but these are still somewhat slow cards. Mind Control Tech does gets the job done in tempo fairly nicely, but she is under serious concern of the amount of damage that's being pushed through early here from her opponent. Oh, Peddler and Ooze are pretty good here. That's a, a turn four. Picking up that second two drop was nice. Uh, ooh, what's the decision here? Um... The decision here is to is which minion you pick that isn't flaming. Um, Worgen Infiltrator is probably going to be more useful than Power Overwhelming. Uh, it's just a minion that you can kind of get guarantee to get to stick on the board and trade on your terms. It's not going to be removed by your opponent with like a Unleash the Hounds play or just hit down with a weapon so that the minions can keep going through. So I think I'd like to see the, the Worgen Infiltrator picked up here. The Power Overwhelming really like you're not in a position to be going face in this matchup as the as the control warlock and what are you going to use power overwhelming to trade into right like maybe the high main in the end game oh, it looks like she disagrees and is going to pick it up yeah it does throw that ooze which pretty much a no-brainer to get rid of that bowl yep i am b cow a little bit early for for al to come out here 
Um, so yeah, it looks... it's, not, it's not the final draw of the game, so it's right. a little bit early. Yeah, so it looks like uh, this is going to be a juggler hero power turn at least. And we'll see if the abusive comes down as well, just to try and pick up a juggle. Yep, trades out the peddler, and interesting. Did Crash just left a 3-2 on the board instead of a 2-2, right? Hello? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, sure. Fine, I guess. That does feel a little bit weird. That you, you're not wrong. That's yeah. that's a decision that Cranage has made. It is. Um, but this is a very, very nice, awkward number. Oh, of course. Ah, that makes sense. Sorry, we don't have the uh, secret overlay up right now, so I didn't acknowledge the fact that Freezing Trap was in play. So he values the ooze being sent back to the hand over the Dark Peddler being sent back to the hand, which is an interesting decision in itself, but it's yeah. one that's, that's not strictly wrong in the sense that leaving the 3-2 alive was. Yeah, okay, so he thinks it's more potentially damaging for Eloise to be able to play a 2-2 two -two for 4 and a 1-drop than being mm. able to destroy another weapon. Yeah. Does, the one, does that the suggest one drop... maybe one bow? Um, it's possible, but if you consider the one drops, you can get Coil, which is a useful card, can dig you to Reno if you need it. You can get um, a couple of taunts that cost one mana. You can get Voodoo Doctor that costs one mana. These are all things that have a, some sort of impact on the game, so maybe that's his consideration. But as you said, maybe there's just a, a lack of too many um, Glaivezookas and Eaglehorn bows in this deck. But Glaivezooka is such an it's... insane card. We haven't seen a single Glaivezooka, though. No, but it's so broken. Like In in this deck, it's so damn good, I'd be yeah. amazed if it was come. Well, because Worgen Infiltrator turn one, or Leopard on turn one, into Glaivezooka turn two, right. is just nuts. Yeah, Worgen is usually one of the things that's cut from the, the hybrid list to make room for some of the more late game, but still, like you're looking to go one drop into Glaivezooka with aggressive hunters. It's like your dream opening. Well, it's... Uh, the owl is in hand for Cranch. Look at Cranch's face. He feels. He looks a little bit smug, if I'm honest. He does. Going against that owl because Eloise looking at outs here did immediately reach for that sludge belcher, which would not be enough to keep her alive. Of course, this is the deciding game, so we're, it does feel like we're rapidly reaching a, a conclusion of this series here. Yeah, and personally, I don't see it here. Like you said, belcher isn't enough. I don't think any outcome of mind control tech is enough either. Nope. Uh, so I believe that is GG. I don't think tap into any card for mana or less is going to get the job done either. No. Uh, or Shadow Flame, but then he takes, she takes two damage from the Lepanome. There's two knives that get thrown after trading into the high main, which means Shadow Flame either kills you or doesn't work. Yeah, uh, that was, was just going to be game. All right, well, Kranich is going to advance to the round of eight over Eloise 3 to do a close series here, our first match of the day, and he will be the first person to make it to the top 8, so a win for Dignitas, and a, a loss for Eloise. I mean, we talked about Kranich earlier on, Kranich is a player who, you know, you said that you respect it as one of the greatest achievements in Hearthstone, him doing back, him reaching back-to-back -back World Championship Finals. Yep. I would tend to agree, and I, I feel like when we talk about long-term consistent performers and strong performers and people who can really beat just about anyone on their day. I mean, we saw him beat players like Life Coach mm -hmm. in his group. Uh, Kranich doesn't necessarily get enough credit. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know whether that's part of him being a little bit separated from the Western scene. You know, he is part of a Western organization in Team Dignitas, but generally he is still a little bit separated. Maybe we don't get as much exposure to him as, as we should do, but there is no doubt in my mind that that achievement of back-to-back -back BlizzCons does not come about by accident. It's come about because he is phenomenally good at Hearthstone and deserves his name up there like with the very best. Yeah, absolutely. And Eloise, well, that was a very close match. You can't necessarily, you can't take anything away from Eloise there. Three to two, some uh, some very good Druid play from Eloise to get those wins. But Kranich is going to be advancing to our top eight. And, you know, it might be a little bit early, but Kranich, a potential contender to, to take this whole thing. It is definitely early, Callum, to be talking about these things, but he's off to a good start, right? And he, he's still in the tournament, therefore he has a chance of winning it. That's that's my analysis at this point, but the player pool is stacked to the point where even someone that we've just evangelized about being as good as Kranich is, you can't even say is a standout favorite, because there's so many other huge names on his level or possibly even above his level in this tournament. Um, that it, it's hard to make any sort of prediction at this point. But Kranich definitely will be happy with his win. And again, a 3-2 victory. And we talked about at the start 
how important it was for Kranich to pick up that unfavoured matchup win in game one with the Rogue beating the Warrior. When you end up winning the series 3-2, then that kind of hammers home the point of how important those sorts of wins are in this format. Absolutely. Well, speaking of, pl of players who are world class and have a lot of achievements to their name, we're going to see Sixo in our next game. He's going to be going up against the Jor dude, the Who dude. We'll find out after the break.